Hi friends, welcome to Stamp Chat. So happy that you could join us on the APS Stamp Chat. Today's guest, we have Mr. Kurt Streepy, and he is presenting a, a program called On Collecting First Issues of the World. It's a really interesting way of building your collections and learning about different countries and history. It's a really fascinating way to develop your collection. And, and Kurt Streepy has, just enough passion and, and know-how to really start to get you started on that journey. So we appreciate that he's with us. To the APS members that make this possible, we thank you for your continued support. All of this new programming is because of your dedication to the hobby and we promise to run with it and make it happen. Um, and we are open to your ideas, your suggestions, your comments. And if you'd like to be a guest, give us an email. Ie at stamps.org. So let's go ahead and get started with Mr. Kurt Streepy, who's going to begin his presentation. Welcome, Kurt. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, to share my uh, my interest in collecting first issues of the world. <clears throat> so uh, for today, as Heidi said, we're going to talk about collecting first issues uh, of the world. I uh, will uh, kind of go through here uh, looking at both collecting in general, uh, my collecting, and then uh, the First Issue Collecting Club. Uh, so first of all, uh, I am the Secretary Treasurer of the First Issue Collector Club. Uh, I'm also kind of the interim social media director. We've just tried to expand our footprint uh, into social media here recently, uh, both with this uh, video and uh, going on to Twitter and looking at some other opportunities to uh, help people uh, find our organization. Um, the first issue Collectors Club, uh, we were founded in uh, 1990. Uh, we were an international club, uh, have uh, members from around the world. Uh, we had a period of time where we had members from all six populated continents. Um, unfortunately, we uh, lost our Australian member and our South, Amer or South African member, so uh, we need to work on a couple continents to get back on that list. Uh, we um, have a quarterly newsletter, and that newsletter includes a mail bid sale uh, related to first issues. And uh, we also have a website uh, that's uh, full of uh, useful information that uh, I'll share some of that information as we go along today. Uh, but um, but definitely take the, take a look at that. Uh, there's you know even if you're not necessarily a first issue collector, there's uh, definitely some uh, interesting uh, info on there to share. We've been an APS affiliate since uh, 1997. Um, so we've uh, been part of that family now for a while. So uh, what is Collecting First Issues? Um, there, uh, as we put this organization together, there, there was a lot of questions about that, uh, you know, all, all the way to what was the name of our uh, club going to be? Was it, you know, number ones of the world or was it First Issues? Um, so, so we did settle on first issues because it uh, captured a larger uh, portion of what, uh, what it is that we look at. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of go through some different categories of, of what people might consider in their collection uh, and then share some examples. So, you know, the, the first one that's out there is collecting the catalog number one. Uh, and that's, you know, definitely probably the most common uh, look at uh, collecting first issues. Um, so now as an international organization, you know, we have to consider uh, when you say catalog, it's what catalog are you using? Um, you know, here in the, in the United States, it's primarily Scott. Uh, but, you know, uh, with our four members, there's a number of other catalogs, Stanley Gibson, McCall, and, and others that people will reference when they're um, talking about their first issues. So going back to Scott, um, Last time we did a count, there were uh, 642 number ones in Scott. So um, that number uh, obviously can, can change in time, uh, but uh, stays pretty stable for the most part is uh, there's a limited number of countries that, that, that appear uh, or stamp issuing entities that appear. Um, <clears throat> the next one is uh, going uh, with the stamp by the issue date. So uh, we will discuss here shortly that there's there's some issues in there that, um, particularly with Scott, it's not the first issue, uh, the stamp that was issued first, it's listed number one, it might be listed uh, later uh, uh, in a following number. Uh, then there's also the first stamp uh, just listed in the catalog period uh, for each country. 
Uh, again, we'll look at some places where Scott didn't start with number one, it started with another issue first. Um, so if, if you look at just listings like that of, of stamp issuing entities, uh, last time we, we ran the numbers, it was uh, 781. Uh, and that also includes the L's uh, that we'll talk about here uh, as we go along. Uh, and then a little further into it, we can get change of administration. Uh, this is where uh, a collector looks at not just uh, the number one or uh, the first one in the catalog, but maybe it's the first time after uh, a name change for the country or a, of a significant government change within the company co country. So then you may have multiple issues from the same country uh, that you uh, are collecting. And then finally, we can look at some back of the book um, areas as well. Um, so first, we'll start with, with the catalog number one. Uh, this is kind of the basis. This is where I started when I started collecting number ones. Our first issues uh, was looking at the number one. Um, so you may have, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a good example here, you know, British uh, Guyana, uh, they issued their first stamp in 1850. Uh, I don't have a picture of that one, don't have that one, unfortunately, uh, as uh, very few people do. Uh, but um, then a few years later, uh, in uh, 1966, when the country became independent and was named uh, Guyana, they issued uh, a number one, or Scott listed as a number one, uh, with the new listing for Guyana. And there's a number of other countries here. You'll see that, you know, Great Britain has number one, U.S. has number one. Uh, but I always find it interesting tracking the colonies, um, former colonies that turn into a, a new nation and they get their own number one, get their own listing in Scott. So um, the next you have places that uh, they don't start with the number one in the catalog. Uh, and, and as those examples I just showed you are some former colonies that turned into uh, independent nations. Uh, that, that's the example here too, but in this case, uh, particularly in Scott, um, for some reason they didn't start this new listing with a number one, they just continued the numbering system from the prior listing. So that's where you get some examples of countries that don't have a number one in the catalog. So we have British Honduras um, that uh, was a colony, uh, had, there's a number one under British Honduras, uh, became a self-governing um, entity in 64, uh, and, but kept that same name of British Honduras for a while. Uh, and then the name was changed uh, in 73 uh, to Belize. But when this name change occurred, um, Scott did not um, give Belize a new listing. Um, they started at uh, 312, which is um, a continuation from the British um, Honduras that stopped at 311. Um, and there are a number of other examples with that. Again, generally colonies, Rhodesia went to uh, 1 through 4, 13, and then Zimbabwe shows up at 4, 14 when it became uh, an independent country. So um, so that, that's that look at let's find something. We still want to collect Zimbabwe, but we, we don't have a number one, so let's get the first stamp that's in that, um, that country's listing. Um, so here's an example from, from my collection. Uh, we, I have Grand Camoro uh, 1 through 19. Uh, that was the first issue uh, of, of that colony as, as a French colony. And then later uh, it became uh, Camoro and the, uh, the listing uh, continued um, starting at 30, uh, which was a continuation of, of Grand Camaro instead of starting at, at number one as a new, car, a new country. And then there are some other cases where there's not a number one um, at all. The, the, the issue starts at, at a different number, but it's not because of a continuation. Um, they just, uh, Far East Republic and um, Cecilia are, are examples of, they both start at number two. There is no number one. Um, so, you know, we've had some examples and, and some folks that have done articles in our journal where they've looked back to, to why these are missing. And some examples would be that maybe Maybe Scott had listed a number one at one point in time, but at a later point they decided it was either uh, not actually issued uh, or was not really associated with that that government. So they uh, they unlisted it and just went to um, uh, to starting the, and with the number two and not renumbering the entire system. So so again, that's a kind of an example of hitting 
just hitting whatever the first stamp is within the, uh, the country listing. And then we go to um, really getting into, maybe getting more into the weeds of being accurate on collecting your first issue uh, is looking at them chronologically, like which stamp actually was printed and uh, maybe not printed, but which one was actually used and issued first. So when you look at the older issues um, within the catalog, generally uh, the, the catalogs will list the group based on from the lowest to the highest denomination um, within the set. So the lowest denomination is going to get the number one. Well, you know, in some cases, these uh, initial sets were issued over many years, um, but by the time we list them in, in the catalog, they, they lumped them together and put them by denomination. So a good example is uh, Australia. Um, their, their issue of uh, 1 through 15 um, is ordered in Scott by denomination, but if you actually look at the issue date, uh, number two came first. And that was the first one that to be issued. Uh, and number one actually didn't, was the third stamp to come out. So if you were maybe a purist looking at, at the very first issue date, then number one, then number two would be the one that, that you would have in your collection. And the same kind of goes for a number of other issues. French colonies uh, starts with number three. Um, Italian colonies is a very interesting one uh, because they list uh, Scott, um, Scott lists number one through 12. Uh, with an issue date of July 11th of 1932. And then right below it, they list Scott 13 through 22 with an issue date of July 1, 1932. So uh, the catalog you know, even has the issue date and, and is lit showing an older set um, uh, or a newer set before the, the, the original issue. So, uh, and, and then in Stanley Gibson, they, they have those sets um, switched uh, based on the issue date. So. Uh, again, as, as we talk to other members of the organization across uh, across the world, uh, we kind of, again have to keep in mind that the catalogs don't always uh, match up to uh, to each other. Uh, in, in many cases, they rarely match up. So, so here's a shot from our website where we looking at the Australia uh, with the actual issue dates uh, listed, uh, where the um, the number three came out uh, about two weeks uh, before the number one did. Uh, and, and you know we try to provide whatever additional information we can add to the to the listing. Um, so you know in this case we've also have the, the Stanley Gibson numbers there next to the Scott ones, uh, just as a bit of reference for our um, our members that that use uh, SG. And also you can kind of quickly see where, where the numbers just don't match up uh, at all for for most for a lot of the issues. And then if we have the number of, of issued, uh, we'll, we'll put that information in there. We also put information such as who printed it or engraved it or uh, how it was uh, issued um, uh, when we can find that information. Uh, and our, our webmaster is always open to suggestions when somebody's looking at a page and, and they can provide more information uh, on that particular issue. Uh, <clears throat> So the next we go to uh, change of administration. Uh, and this is the one I kind of mentioned where, where you can look at a country and see where uh, history has changed the, the, the postage stamp uh, in those in that country. So, um, you know, Germany is a good example where uh, it's gone through some significant changes in the um, governmental administration. And in a lot of those cases, it, it leads to uh, a change in the stamp, you know, whether it's the name that's on the stamp uh, or the uh, topics that are that are hit. So, uh, you know, Germany went from being the empire to the, the Weimar Republic after uh, World War One. Uh, the Third Reich came along, uh, <clears throat> leading up to World War Two, um, and then after World War Two, uh, we we had West Germany. We also would have East Germany as well that could be added in there uh, as part of this. And then uh, back in uh, 1990, uh, when uh, the two reunited, uh, another issue came out. So, so there's really five, you know, six if you throw in East Germany, uh, significant changes to um, to the German um, government and, and the postage stamps that came along. So, uh, you know, here's an example from my collection. Uh, I generally don't 
it collect the change of, of government, change of administration issues. Um, as I mentioned there on the Germany one, you know, where it's just been a continuous country with, with some changes. But I do collect uh, when there's been a long hiatus between, between issuing. So, uh, you know, you had Croatia uh, as an independent state uh, in 41 issue stamps, um, but then after um, uh, it got absorbed into Yugoslavia and, and became uh, uh, that country for a while, uh, after the breakup uh, in 1991, they issued stamps again. So um, Scott continued the listing of Croatia. So the new issues in 1991 uh, started at 100. So that's where I started uh, my collection with, uh, is, is having the original one through eight uh, from the independent state and then adding in um, the 100 from the Republic. Um, and then, uh, you know, many of the collectors don't just stop at number one. I mentioned earlier um, about adding in the L's that may um, represent uh, particular countries or regions or, or local areas um, as a whole nother kind of uh, quote country uh, that you might look at. So, uh, you know, here I got some examples. A lot of these are, are um, you know, Arctic areas like Australia or the Falklands that, that have um, uh, regions there that they issue stamped for or did. Um, you know, the, the Switzerland, the, the Cantons were um, given L's. And then there's also some offices. Uh, there's some um, locals under, under China um, that are, are issued and, and available too. So that, that adds another, again, it's an actual area that the stamp is issued for. Um, so that, that kind of is a, a, an entity uh, versus maybe some of the other back of the books that are, you know, issued for the whole country, you know, an airmail is for the whole country. This is still for a particular area. Um, so here's a few examples um, from my collection um, using um, here's the Australian Antarctic Territory and then one of the uh, one of the Falkland Islands uh, issues. So I add those L's in there to uh, to represent those areas. Uh, the next one are the occupations and. Perspective of kind of doing the research as to. Uh, when and where and how uh, these locations were occupied, um, what what happened to the stamp issuing uh, of the country and, and the new uh, entity that came in and, and issued stamps, whether they be overprints of the originals uh, or they printed their own. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of countries with the um, uh, with the N, which usually is a, a prefix used for occupation stamps. Um, so um, for the most part, you know, they're World War II, World War, uh, World War I, World War II, but there are some other, definitely some other ones out there that there are somewhat unrelated to those areas. So, uh, you know, here's an example of one from Estonia. Uh, and the way Scott lists um, the occupation stamps is very interesting because if the same country occupies a country, uh, in different periods of time, they don't necessarily start over with a new set of occupation numbers. Um, is, you know, as you uh, look at, at some countries, they'll have a one in one, a two in one, a three in one, because it's different occupying entities or different areas that are being occupied. Um, Germany post World War II is a good example. There, there are you know uh, a number of those number ones. I think 15, maybe I think it gets up to 15 and one. So there, there's a large group there. So, but this one, in this case, this is Estonia. Um, they were occupied in World War I by Germany. Um, they came in uh, and took uh, Russian stamps that were being used at that time in Estonia uh, and overprinted them uh, and issued them as occupation stamps. So then um, they were freed after uh, World War uh, I. Uh, and then in World War II, they were again occupied by Germany. And it, Germany this time issued stamps specifically printed for uh, for the area. Uh, and this is Scott in three through five. So Scott didn't start over with a new number one here, uh, but since it was a significant change in the time period, again, you, you're issuing stamps and then you stopped issuing stamps and you issued stamps again. 
um, I added that to my collection just because I, I like that history that goes along with that piece. <clears throat> and then, you know, finally we have the back of the book area. Um, so this might include uh, probably the most popular one we see from this are, are air mails, the seas. Um, so we do have on the website have a list of all the seas that are available. And um, the, the C ones are definitely a group that uh, is obtainable to, to collect nearly all of them. There's only about three that would be uh, difficult to find or, or maybe more on the uh, on the pricier side that you're you're not going to just just find uh, in everybody's collection, but definitely something that somebody can put together uh, a very nice collection of seeds. Uh, and then you can go right on down the alphabet. Um, you know, you can collect these or you know semi postals to, or to express the the E's. Uh, and then uh, postal stationery is also out there. Um, the U ones, the U C ones, the U X ones, and and down the road. Um, so there there's um, just kind of a huge group of, of possibilities there. Um, one of my prior one of my project collections for a while was collecting all the ones of the U S. So I, I had a collection, you know, I had Scott number one, it had a C1, it had a, uh, a B1, and it had a, a E1, and a Q1, and a QE1, and, and on down the road, I was trying to get all, all those ones. And for the most part, that's not a collection that's um, uh, an, an, an expensive collection to try to collect, uh, more of it is just trying to actually find the stamp, especially when I I try to even get into the revenues and the, you know the, the different R1s and then the, you know RE1 and RW1 and you know on down that path it, you know definitely as I got got through most of the other uh, normal postal type items and hit the revenue uh, to hit those other ones so uh, so there's definitely some opportunities for some little uh, side projects that that definitely can keep this interesting or or allow you to uh, focus on a special area that, that you're most interested in. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, collecting number ones, uh, our first issues, um, does not have to be um, a, a fiscal challenge. Um, there are um, a, a number of number ones uh, that are, are within the price range of almost any collector. Now, I'll, I'll admit this data is, um, is dated. Uh, it's from 2014. Uh, but we've not had uh, someone step up to uh, do a, a newer version lately. So um, I want to, uh, you know, let's kind of use this as an example. But, you know, when this when this uh, collector in our group did this, he found that more than half of the first issues uh, had a catalog value of less than $10. Um, so, you know, you, you can find over, you know, 450 um, different stamp issues that are uh, within that uh, less than a dollar to a ten dollar range uh, <clears throat> so that you know gives you a great opportunity to find items and, and you know i will say and, and we've had a number of articles on this in our newsletter that sometimes it's, it's more of the chase to find some of these things than it is you know the the cost of them uh you know digging up and finding some uh, minimum value number ones uh can be a challenge because you're you know a lot of your dealers aren't going to have a, a price list that lists um you know just buying a uh, a, a Ind indonesia 2l1 is not something you just see on a price list very often um, but it is uh, fun to look for so so it's definitely uh you know a, a collecting interest that allows you to uh to not break the bank now that obviously there are, as with anything you collect uh, there are going to be a couple of you know, a handful of items are just out of reach of anybody. And, and if you're lucky, you might get to go see them in a museum. Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, those are the items that, that not everybody's going to have. So, um, so as I went along here, I kind of, you know, shared some of how I collect, but I just kind of wanted to kind of summarize, you know, what it is that I do and, and, and how I look at some of this. Um, so, I originally started as a number one person. I started collecting first issues um, when, when the club first started. Actually, before the club started, um, I worked with the dealer uh, that ultimately started this club. But and I just did with Scott number one. Uh, I was in you know early high school or yeah early high school or, or late middle school when I started. So I was just buying you know uh, number ones like I get for a quarter um, to start that collection. 
Um, but uh, you know, as time went on, I, I was able to, to to add to my collection, and then eventually, kind of after a small hiatus of of serious collecting while my um, while my girls were younger, uh, I got back into it and, and kind of got a, a new fire for for the number ones, and, and I ended up switching over to collecting the first issue. Um, and, and by issue, I define that it, it is what was what is what issue is listed first in the catalog, and, and I and I include that being the first set that was issued. So. So my listing for a country might be a single stamp, like Belarus, number one, is issued by itself. There's no, no additional set. Uh, South Africa, number one, is just a, a single stamp that's available. There's no set. So, so that's what I look for for those countries. But then for countries that issued a set first, um, Australia, one through 15, uh, US, one through two, um, you know, the, those are uh, the issue I look for. So, so what that does is allows me to capture um, the number one, but it also allows me to capture if one of the other stamps was actually issued first. So I kind of, I kind of hit both of those pieces of uh, collecting the, the first issue, uh, number one, and also what was issued first. Um, I did extend my collection, include the, the ends, the occupation, and the L's, the, the locals. Uh, and, and for most part, that's because of the history behind those. I just enjoy that the ability to research those uh, and, and find out um, more about the occupation situation and, and what led to, um, to those stamps being issued. Uh, so those are there. And then, uh, and, and so by adding those in there with the, the first issues, it, my want list had about 855 countries, we'll say quotes around country. Uh, but stamp issuing entities um, that uh, were on my list. Uh, as I mentioned with the occupations, um, it, it does extend beyond the first set. If, if there was some sort of difference, that, um, you know, like in the Estonia version, I gave you uh, the stamps were issued and then Germany reinvaded later and, and issued new stamps again. So there was a breakup there. Uh, same way with many of these countries. Uh, that, um, um, for example, if you look at Russia's uh, occupation stamps, uh, there's one big long run of German occupation, but but there's different time periods um, and different entities. So maybe there's German occupation of Ukraine, German occupation of you know different sections within Russia. So I ended up taking all those little sections to include those. And then, like anything else, there's always that opportunity. Um, to do other interesting items because you, you, there is no standard catalog or standard um, uh, album for um, first issues. So uh, it's not like if there's not a place in the catalog, I can't, or not a place in the album, so I can't collect it. That's not the case. Uh, you can put in there anything you want to put in there. So, um, so an example of that is a complete country. I, you know, I, if I look and I'm, I'm going to collect the first set, and then I realize, well, hey, if there's one more set, and if I get that other set, then I've got the complete country. Well, then, you know, if that opportunity comes along, I'm going to take it. So, so here's an example with uh, uh, Laragra that, you know, one through 13 was on my want list. I, I got that. And when I was getting it, I, I realized they also had a 14 through 26. And that, and if I pick that up also, then I had the complete country. So I thought that would be a nice, you know, nice thing to nice thing to have. So uh, I added that to the collection. So uh, I do that with a, a few other countries as well, just depending on um, on what other issues were beyond the first. Um, I'll also go on, go beyond the Scott catalog um, again because we will number one have some people that will write articles that about uh, stamps that aren't listed in the Scott catalog. So you know it's interesting to read those. And then a lot of times these stamps that are um, issued by entities that, that Scott might not think are a, a true stamp issuing entity, um, they have a lot of history, a lot of interest behind them, um, just because maybe they're, they're local, uh, they're a breakaway republic. Um, you know, why were the stamps issued? Are they propaganda or are they, were they really used as a stamp? Um, so, so I end up adding those, um, this um, uh, breakaway republic here, this mountainous republic of um, Karabuka uh, is um, in um, 
is in uh, Azerbaijan, but most of the people who live there are Armenian. Uh, so they they tried to break away and make their own republic, and it's still currently, as of you know today, considered a breakaway republic. Uh, they're not a, a, a universal postal union member. Uh, they're not recognized by really anybody, including um, including Armenia, even though they support them. But the the interest of of just reading about them led me to go ahead and and, and find the stamps. Um, and there's some other examples here as well that might be listed in, in Cal or, or Stanley Gibson, but not Scott. So, uh, and it kind of, you know, they, they kind of go along with that occupational local interest that I have of being able to read about these and, and find out the history. Uh, and then, you know, that anything I like kind of thing, you know, kind of leads to some rabbit holes. Um, so this is Latvia number one, uh, which is an imprint, imper, imper stamp. And um, they were printed on the back of German war maps after um, World War I. Uh, there was a shortage of paper, but there was enough war maps laying around to be used for anything and everything. Uh, so they printed stamps on the back of them. So if you flip your stamp over, um, you'll see a map on most of the back of them. And um, these are some larger, you know, this down here in the, uh, the bottom is a, a single stamp and then these are you know blocks of four and block of six and, um, and a larger block here that's probably block of nine um, that um, I printed yes I've shown them backwards so I can see the maps and then here's uh, Latvia number two which is perforated stamp same issue just the perforated stamp and and you can really get into the weeds here and, and the different types of map the different types of print uh, the different you know languages used on the map uh, really lead to some interesting um, uh, search, and, and you know this is a, a bigger example of that that map on the back, and and you can actually get some stamps that will be blank on the back because they happen to be in a margin uh, where there's no no picture. So you will on occasion find some stamps that don't have a map. And then you know if, if it's not challenging enough to find some of these um, first issues, it, it is try to find them on a cover. Um, and, and finding them on a cover that's not philatelic uh, related is an even bigger challenge. So, you know, here's here's an example from Ghana that I found. Um, it's not a pretty cover. Uh, I, I still, you know, it got forwarded to a different address, but uh, I still think it's philatelic just because the whole set's on there. You know, it's not a first day or anything like they, they mailed a first day cover, but they did put the whole set on there. So it's probably a little bit on the philatelic side. Um, this Puerto Rico one, uh, is one of my favorites. Um, I'm actually outside of collecting number ones. I also collect um, U.S. possessions. So, um, so this one kind of hits my interest in a couple of areas. But it has um, this is a Puerto Rico UX one. So it's the first postcard uh, for Puerto Rico. It's actually a U.S. postcard. I think it's UX four of the U.S. with a Puerto Rico um, uh, overprint down here um, on the bottom. So that's UX1, that's pretty interesting, with the 210, which is the first um, regular issue by the US administration in Puerto Rico. So it's kind of a, a first stamp on a first postcard. So, and, and the rate is correct. This is a, a an uprated card uh, from Puerto Rico to Germany. So, so on the front, this is definitely, you know, a, a normal, you know, use of the stamp um, at the time. Now, when you read the back, it, it does become a little philatelic because the back is a um, uh, is a uh, message in uh, in German um, asking if this particular person is interested in purchasing a large quantity of Spanish Puerto Rico and U.S. Puerto Rico stamps. So um, you know it's somebody reaching out to a stamp dealer to see if they're interested in, in buying um, some stamps. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that, um, you know, is the challenge for uh, a collector of first issues is how are you going to display them? Uh, and this was, you know, kind of my, in the beginning, um, this is how I displayed them. I just, you know, used the black stock cards with clear fronts and uh, made a little card and stuck in there of what the issue was and, and you know, and then I spent a lot of time moving things around as I found more. And, um, and it made me, you know, it was a little tough and, and I, I think it kind of slowed my interest in number ones. At that point in time, I, I only collected the first issue, the number one, 
Um, but it still, you know, uh, it wasn't appealing as appealing to me as if, if I had something a little uh, better way to present it. But when I kind of retook a look at and got my collection back out, then I went to making my own pages. And that's what really um, grew my interest in the first issues again uh, was because I, I could um, put something together to present here. And so I spent a little time and I'll research the stamp issuing entity and uh, find you know either some interesting information about the particular stamps that were issued, why they were issued, uh, or or information about the country uh, that issued them. Uh, you know when we're talking colonies and occupations, you know I look at um, what stamps were used before. You know what did they? You know what country did it turn into? Uh, what country uh, issued stamps there? So you know that's that history that <clears throat> I <clears throat> that I enjoy. Um, that gives me a good look at that to see um, see what's next in that country. <clears throat> so you know, kind of looking at, at a few other areas that that you know you can look at within number ones um, <clears throat> is that um, you you will find a number of forgeries, particularly in those early stamps. So um, on our website, we do have a um, a section on there on forgeries. It's certainly not all inclusive. Um, you know, there there are a number of, of very good references uh, that you want to look at, such as uh, Album Weeds, uh, the Sarian Guide, uh, Focus on Forgeries for some of the lower uh, cost items. Um, these will help you kind of pick some of those weeds out of there. And but but it's not all for naught. I have a um, a collection of forgeries and fakes and facsimiles that. Have come across um, uh, through collections I've purchased and things I've sorted out, you know. And sometimes you're disappointed that you uh, that you know something's not what you thought it was. But at the same time, again, that if you enjoy that look back at, at why they were made, uh, that can also be interesting. And sometimes, you know, collecting forgeries are just as hard as collecting the originals because um, I've been working on a, a set of Az Azerbaijan. Um, forgeries for uh, quite some time. I, I, I've, um, you know, may, was able to get the originals and, and get the sets and, and I was told that the forgeries are, are even more common in, in everybody's collection, but I sure have a hard time getting the whole set together. So, so sometimes there's interest in that. And, and also as you research some of the, uh, the really um, uh, intricate um, forgeries, you'll see there sometimes the forgeries are, are as desirable and as valuable as the original stamps. Um, so that that is, uh, you know, always interesting to see. And, and when you look at uh, how some of these were made, and, um, you know, Casey Joe had a great comment about this, that um, in, in the early collecting days, back in the 1800s, uh, that some of these stamps weren't made to be forgeries or to fool people. Um, They're made to help a collector feel, fill a hole in their cattle, in their um, album. You know, they, you know, got this hole of something I can never get. So that they were made for the purpose of filling that spot. But as the collection, you know, maybe, you know, someone passes away and it gets passed on to the next person and the next person, um, the idea that those are forgeries gets lost. Um, or that their facsimiles gets lost and, and they're just sold with the assumption that they're real and then they end up in somebody's collection as the real thing. Uh, so that's so you know that that research on on forgeries is is very interesting uh, side piece again to look at. So uh, I, I keep my facsimiles and forgeries in a separate binder, but uh, but I, I work on those just the same uh, as I do my collection because it's nice to have that that reference collection available. And then, um, you know, uh, kind of digging into why why do I collect number ones? Um, you know, what, what got me started? Um, I started collecting as, um, uh, you know, a, as a grade school um, um, age um, child, I guess, and uh, did it during Boy Scouts. And uh, that led me to, um, that led me to, um, look at, you know, worldwide packets, you know, I was seeing all this stuff and, and collecting worldwide. And then as I got farther and farther along, uh, it became a little bit overwhelming to have this giant album with all these holes in it. 
And then all these stamps that I had that didn't fit in the holes because there weren't pages for those stamps. So, you know, it got a little bit uh, overwhelming for me, I guess. And so um, I, I, I decided not to collect worldwide anymore, boxed it all up, got rid of it. I was going to focus on U.S. and U.S. possessions. because so I thought U.S. possessions are, there's a uh, defined number. They're all done issuing stamps. So here's your list. I can make a checklist. I knew exactly what I needed to get. Uh, but I... Um, was um, a little concerned that um, we had listed, you know, th then I lost the sight of the worldwide, learning about uh, all these countries, learning about the uh, occupations, and that's what interested me there, is like, hey, I, I want to see all this stuff too, and I want to learn about it, and that's where I found uh, First Issues, so it gave me that opportunity to, again, collect around the world, but not have such a mass of volume that I was trying to look for. So uh, it really helped with that piece of, of history of, of being able to, to research the country and learn about them, but not worried about finding, you know, three or, you know, finding 5,000 stamps to fill the Russian pages on in the stamp album. So, so that was great. Uh, and, and so I highly encourage, you know, looking at it from that perspective of uh, considering uh, why you want to collect those. So uh, to, to kind of close out here, um, you know, again, I want to thank APS for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, I want to, um, you know, offer you the opportunity to, to get a free issue of First Issues if you want to, to give that a try. Uh, check out our website and please check us out on Twitter uh, because uh, happy to share um, that um, that information with you and, and, and you guys can help share and spread uh, information about first issues um, to the rest of us. All right, Heidi, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you. Yeah, literally, I, I went around the globe with you and it was it's such a fascinating way to build one's collection and the 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 postal history of in that you found with that Puerto Rico postcard that was that was an extraordinary piece that really was yeah. um i think for for collectors young and old experienced novice this is a really fascinating way to build out your collection and as kurt had said go down the rabbit hole and just continue to go deeper and deeper into the woods. And, and I love being a part of Philately where the expression in the woods means a good thing. So thank you so much to Kurt Streepy and um, to the First Issues Collectors Club for being APS members since 1997. We really cherish that relationship and, um, you know, together we are better, collaboration for the hobby always bodes well. So thanks so much for your participation, for joining us. Um, Please check out firstissues.org and follow First Issues Collector Club at Twitter. Their handle is at first underscore stamps. And be sure to have fun tagging and making reference, et cetera, et cetera. Again, great way to collect. And we thank you so much to Kirk Street B for joining us. And we look forward to having you as a guest another time. Thank you so much. Thank you.